Good morning on this cool June morning, right? I don't know, man. I opened the door to go in the garage to get in the car, and it felt like I opened my oven, all right? I don't know if it was like you. I had an um, opportunity. Uh, I flew down to Tampa on Wednesday to visit a son I have living down there. Can you believe this? I was down in Tampa in the afternoon. It was 78 degrees. And I thought, man, I don't want to go back. Because <laughs> I kept on looking at the weather forecast of what it is up here, right? And for the week ahead, they were having rain and everything else and down there, but had a great time. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, one of my favorite uh, books. Uh, really, the theme is joy. In fact, I'm getting ready and preparing, going back to Ghana uh, the end of October and uh, doing a series of lessons. I've been playing them out in the book of Philippians, all right, for the young people over there. We've been going through this uh, in our Sunday school small group uh, with the men. And I want to look at Philippians chapter 1 this morning. I'm going to be preaching or teaching uh, on really choosing joy through remembrance, remembrance, memory, remembrance. Now, I don't know about you, I, was, I wrote down a couple of thoughts about memory. I was thinking when I was down there. Whether you understand it right now or not, memory is very, very important in your life, right? Uh, as a young person, sometimes you don't appreciate it. You can, you know, remember certain things. You can recall them. Uh, but I would add this. All right, I learned this as we get old. Memory is very fragile, all right? And um, you can... Uh, not be quite as sharp as when you get, you know, 75, 76, 77. There can be physical reasons. Uh, there can be emotional reasons. I, right, you know, flew uh, out and I had uh, taken another trip a while back. You ever park in those garages over there at the airport and be um, not smart enough to write down where you parked your car? <laughs> and then all of a sudden when you're flying back. I don't know where my car is. <laughs> In fact, you started, what floor am I on? Let alone floor, right, of those aisles. Have you, anybody beside me had the pleasure of going up and down aisles, right, trying to push your thing? All right, so there's other people have, have done that, all right? Uh, in the old days, it wouldn't be that bad. What do you understand? Devil, I believe, and I believe this is true, one of the devil's major battlegrounds is your mind. All right. Uh, again, I, I think he has a strategy to try to get us to forget who we are as believers. And no way you can live the life that God wants you to live or you can really experience any peace and joy in your life unless you understand, all right, not only yourself but your circumstances in life from the eyes of God. I, as a pastor, I have many, many occasions to see and be alongside families whose loved ones died of Alzheimer's, terrible disease, all right? I believe we have a lot of um, adults and um, faith that maybe have Alzheimer's. We forget who we are. We forget who our God is. And, um, I, I, and we need to be intentional in remembering. I still remember, remember when you were, in fact, I was speaking to my grandkids. I pick up uh, two of my uh, grandsons from school usually every day every day. And at the end of the year, they go through these tests, am I right, to see whether the teachers were doing their job. And uh, I was asking them, and they were talking about everything that the teacher tells them they got to do. They got to get that good sleep. They got to eat a good breakfast, right? You know, a good breakfast nowadays. Uh, they were t I was kidding with them. You know what they call a good breakfast? Pop-tart, right? <laughs> at home, they have a grandpa. But you got to study. And then the big thing was no distractions, right? You can't have a lot of things going on that you'd be distracted. Well, I, I, I think that, you know, the devil understands this. And in our lives, he brings distractions. Am I right? Whether it's in this world, whether it's in our family, whether it's financial, whatever it is, uh, that, um, that we would forget. Forget our faith, forget our God, forget really the life that we are to have and the joy and peace that God intends us to have. So I'm going to be looking a little bit about this. Now, if you have an opportunity this week, I'm going to challenge you to read Philippians chapter 1. All right, I'm not going to be able to read the whole chapter, but I'm looking at the chapter and what, what I have seen, all right, to be able to share this. Now, 
A little background Paul's situation. Paul's writing this letter. He's a prisoner at Rome. He's been accused of rebellion, all right, against the state of Rome due to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and living according to uh, the word of God's dictates. Sometimes I think maybe we're headed that way, but he's there in prison. He's chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day, all right, in six-hour shifts. Uh, his court case is coming up soon. Possibility, he doesn't know it, but he could be beheaded. Uh, Paul's dream now has been, you know, Paul always dreamed to go to Rome. He wanted to go to Rome, but he wanted to go as a what? Missionary, all right? And establish churches and visit the churches that were already there. Well, God gave him part of his dream, right? <laughs> he did get to go to Rome, but he didn't get to go as a all right, missionary, but in that sense that he was thinking, but he went there as a prisoner. Added to this, uh, all the things that were going on. There were those who uh, claimed to be believers that were really halfway glad that he was arrested and really uh, wished him the worst. So the danger, Paul, in that situation would be that he would give in to despair. I mean, you ever come to these times in your life that you are really trying to do what's right, submitting yourself, I surrender all, and at the same time that you're surrendering, at least outwardly, it looks to you, my life has fallen apart. And I can't seem to locate God in the midst of my circumstances. So uh, very easy for Paul to forget who he was as a believer. He could see himself as a failure, all right? He could see himself abandoned by God in the light of his circumstances and what, you know, other people are, are saying about him, all right? So that's the situation. Now, Paul, a little secret he has, is you, at least I see it, as you're reading through this chapter, and I think in our lives, how to keep from despair and worry. I was talking to another one of my kids that was really given into worry and despair. I mean, he pulling up pictures, man, you see this submarine of uh, Russia, I mean, it's right down there of the coast. I mean, there was a lot of things, you, if you want to worry, there's a lot of things to worry about today, is there not? Whether it's the economy, whether it's what's going on in the world, but Paul had a secret. How do you keep from, all right, anxiety and despair and worry? Uh, Paul understood this. And so it took me all my life to understand this. You cannot control really anything, you know, let alone you can't control your circumstances. And you can't control what others think about you or say about you. All right? You can't do it. All right? And uh, Paul could control something. And he could control how he saw himself by remembering, or how he saw himself and his circumstances, by remembering how God saw him. In other words, he, he wanted to see his identity in the eyes of God. And by the way, the only person that can establish your true identity is your creator, is your God. So really, you need to see yourself through the eyes of your creator and the eyes of your Lord. And Paul... He understood, I can determine how I see life, how I see my situation, my circumstances, and myself. And instead of focusing on himself as a prisoner, because that's who he was, right? He couldn't get uh, really away from that fact. I mean, he has chains on his wrist, all right? Uh, and he wasn't going to focus on himself as a prisoner of Rome. He was going to focus on his identity in Christ of how God saw him. And it's very interesting in this letter, all right, to the church at Philippi, he uses the words mind and think over 15 times. I just tell people in our church up in, in New Jersey, when you become a Christian, you do not put your mind in neutral, all right? I mean, literally, uh, we, we are, all right, to think the thoughts of Christ, and our mind needs to be engaged in our faith. And Paul knew that the secret to Christian joy was not in allowing Satan to use, whether it was current circumstances or what other people uh, thought of him, to control his thinking. The secret was for him, and it is for us, to in intentionally choose, I will remember God's word, and I will see myself and my circumstances in the light of how God sees them. Proverbs 23, 7 says this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, all right? 
I can determine whether I'm going to give in to worry, anxiety over everything that's happened, or I'm going to be a victor in Christ. Paul, the prisoner of Rome, he's going to choose to see himself and his circumstances through God's eyes. The question is this morning, how do you see yourself in the midst of the circumstances you're in? You understand, we all come to church and we say, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. We smile. And yet your world can be falling apart, all right? Uh, ask yourself, am I experiencing the joy of God? Where am I today? And what I thought, I would look through chapter 1, all right? And let me give you three things Paul chose to remember. And in the midst of whatever we're facing, no matter how dire it can be, whether it's a cancer diagnosis, whether it's the kids going in a direction that really breaks our heart, whether it's finances or whatever, there's certain things I can choose that will give me joy and peace within my life in the midst of situations I wish were different, but I can't change them, but I can still have that joy and peace. Let me give you three of them, all right? Number one, Paul said, I'm going to remember or chose to remember, all right, that God saw him as his son. All right? God did not see Paul as a prisoner of Rome. God saw Paul's identity as a son, his son, the son of God. Look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. Paul says this, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. He's talking about the church there at Philippi. And he says, for your fellowship in the what? In the gospel. Just as I... All right, I have put my faith in Jesus Christ, message of the gospel, death, burial, resurrection of Christ. You also have put your faith in the gospel and that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. And I, I thank you for that fellowship in the gospel, first day to now. And he goes on being confident in this thing that he has begun a good work and you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. See, Paul understood it was through the gospel of Jesus Christ, he has been born again into the family of God. You know, we need to remember what's important. And what's important, I'm a child of God. No matter what's happening in my life, God is my father. I'm a son of the living God. Uh, Paul talked about this in the book of Romans. Listen to these verses, starting in Romans chapter 8 and verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself, speaking to the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are what? The children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, join heirs of Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. John said it this way in John 1.12, But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name. Paul understood, you could, you could say whatever you want to say about me. You could put whatever label you want to put on me. But I see myself as God sees me. I am his child I am his son. And Paul was able to say that because he obtained righteousness. And by the way, he always wanted, his whole life was in pursuit of righteousness. He thought, I could make myself acceptable to God by living a certain kind of life. But he never could do that. But he found the righteousness not through his merit, by the merit of his Savior. Familiar verses, Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, all right, not by works, so that no one can boast. See, that brought great joy into Paul's life, because Paul had a past. See, he could also have the memory of all the things that he did, of persecuting the church, having believers put to death. But he was going to choose to remember as he was in that cell, no matter what his past was, no matter what his circumstances were, I'm a child of God. And this truth is what brought great joy to Paul's life. That's why he was able to say in verse 21 of chapter 1, for me to live is Christ, 
and to die is gain. He understood that one day he would be united with his father. You know, I read this little uh, illustration somebody was using in a devotional uh, this week. It was talking about an engineer who passed away, uh, Ken, and he had this little note. All right, I know there's other engineers here, but uh, he had this tape. I don't know if you had this tape on your desk. This is what they found. Right, true. This is not my life. This may be my job, but Christ is my life. I think we need to remember that, all right? It's like Paul. He has, in other words, this might be my situation right now. Chains on my arm, but this is not who I am. This is not my life. Christ is my life. So he chose, I'm a son of God. And because he was a son of God, there were certain things that were true that brought joy in his life, all right? He, as a son of God, he belonged to a what? Family. Because there's other children of God. Instead of seeing himself as alone, because Paul's in this situation, really, uh, I mean, there's not friends, really, around him all the time. And sometimes, even in our lives, we can feel that we are alone. Even when in the midst that we have so many people, but in the midst of what circumstances we feel we can't share with others, we feel alone. But Paul did not see himself alone. He saw himself as a member. Of, I'm a son of God, so therefore I'm a member of the family of God. And as he thought of the spiritual family, especially there in Philippi, it brought him great joy because he knew what? They're praying for me. They love me. They care for me. As a Christian, that gives you strength, does it not? I know whether it's mission trips or life, we reach out. I believe in the power of prayer. All right? Nothing is impossible for our God. And Paul, I'm a child of God, he's remembered, and I'm a part of the family of God. They, like him, were sons of God through their fellowship in the gospel. But also as the son of God, Paul's confidence was he knew who his father was. His heavenly father was ever faithful, was all-knowing, and was all-powerful, and was with him in these difficult times. See, as a dad raising my kids, I didn't know where my kids were at all times. In fact, I have one son, in fact, the son I was visiting, he's in ministry now. Thank you, Lord, that I did not know where he was at all times. And he, he's still explaining to me, you know, things that he did that I did not know. But we have a heavenly father, all right, who knows all. So literally, Paul's looking at it. It was God who put me on this path to end up in the situation I'm in. Paul would not have chose that road, all right? But he knew his heavenly father, if he allowed him to be there at Rome in that situation, then as a loving, all-powerful, all-knowing heavenly father, he would meet his what? Every need. Isn't that what he wrote to Rome in, in Romans 8.32? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not graciously, all right, give us all things? If he met our greatest need, will he not even meet our smallest need? And so Paul saw himself. All right, I'm a child of God. Sure, things are not good. I'm not, I'm not saying you deny what's going on. I am a prisoner, all right? I mean, somebody's chained to me 24 hours a day, but I still am a child of God. And that's how I choose to see myself. That's how I choose to see my situation. One of my favorite psalms working on a message on this psalm is Psalm 121, one of the songs of ascent. When uh, there was three uh, feasts that Israel was called to attend uh, and present themselves before God at Jerusalem. And a lot of those that really lived in certain areas going to Jerusalem, which God required, was a very, very difficult journey. All right? Very dangerous journey. And they would sing these songs to themselves. By the way, why do you think they sung these songs to themselves? To remind themselves of certain things on a very dangerous journey to go to Jerusalem. And they reminded themselves, all right, I have a heavenly father who is what? All powerful. In, in Psalm 121, verse 1, I will lift my eyes up to the hills from whence cometh my strength. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That means if he put me on this road, all right, he will meet my every need. 
Also, they kept on singing that he's ever present with me. It might not look like he's here, but he is here. Because they went on and sung, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. In other words, God's not asleep. He knows exactly where you are. He knows what your needs are. And he knows when he needs to intervene in your situation. But they continued to uh, sing, all right, how God met every one of their needs. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. Talking about in the, in the daytime when the sun will be coming upon them on that road. The Lord will meet your needs. It goes on. The Lord's your shade all right, your right hand, the sun will not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. When the sun goes down, the dangers of predators are animals, thieves. He says you don't have to worry. He says the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. Why? You are his son. I understand that. I, I mean, I've seen that in people's lives. I learned that as a young, boy, a young man when I got into ministry, a children's ministry. You don't mess with somebody's children. Mama's coming after you. All right? Dad's coming after you. Let me say, as a child of the living God, I got an all-powerful, ever-present, all right, all-knowing Heavenly Father. I'm His child. That brings joy and peace in my life no matter what's going on. And this is what He's talking about and saying eventually, we'll have ultimate victory. The Lord shall preserve you going out and you're coming in. From this time forth and forevermore. That means wherever he takes you, he'll preserve you until eventually he takes you from this world and brings you into his everlasting presence. They had to sing it to remind themselves. We all need to be reminded, right? Paul says, I'm going to choose to remember in the midst of this situation, I'm a child of God. No matter what situation you're in, I'm saying, remember, you're his child. You have a heavenly Father who will not abandon you, will not forsake you. He knows what he's doing. But not only did he choose to re remember himself or see himself as a child of God, but he chose to see himself as a servant of God. Look at verse 12 and 13. We were singing that song, you know, I surrender all. But Paul says, I want you to know, brethren, that these things that happened to me, and maybe I'm in chains, I'm being held, all right, prisoner. Have you really turned out for the furtherance of the gospel? He said, very interesting. Now, I'm in a bad situation, but yet, whoa, I see God is using this to do something. And he says what he's doing, verse 13, it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. All right? Can you, in fact, think about this. I'm a Roman Praetorian guard, all right? The Caesar's personal guard. Hard man. Would you want to be chained to Paul for six hours? Six hour Bible study. Six hours witnessing. Think about the end of their shift. They, they had to be, oh, praise God. <laughs> He's yours now for the next six hours, right? I mean, this is what he is saying. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, Paul declares, as a believer, we no longer live for ourselves. It's not about my comfort, my plans, my will being done, but I am to serve my God and His will. Again, that song we sung, I Surrender All. In fact, you see that truth throughout the Bible over and over again. Deuteronomy 10, 12, serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Serve. Psalm 100, verse 2, and very verses that we know. Do what to the Lord with gladness? Serve the Lord with gladness. Joshua, as Joshua ends the book in Joshua 24, 15, says, as for me and my house, we're serving God. Again, that word serve. In the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, again, a familiar verse. You were bought with a price. All right, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, and it's little s. It's not Holy Spirit. It means in your body and you really, your passions, your mind, how you think, what you do. You are to serve the living God. You are his servant, his representative. And as a servant, 
Paul sees himself under the authority of a master. And his master is his father, the Lord God. And as a servant, Paul's duty is to do what? Think about it. What is a servant's duty? You do what the master wants, and you go where the master directs you, isn't it? I mean, very simple, right? The master has placed Paul where? In Rome. All right, Paul didn't choose, all right, how he was going to do it, but God chose. And instead of seeing himself as forcefully detained, I'm, you know, arrested, I'm detained, I'm chained by Rome, no freedom to do whatever I want to do, he chose to remember, I'm a servant of God. That means I've been placed here in the exact place where God wants me. Isn't this what God, sometimes God puts us in place, we would never choose. I mean, it's not our top three, it's not even on the sheet, right? And God chooses to put us in those situations. But you know what the comfort is in Paul? That's coming? God doesn't make mistakes. Bill makes mistakes, but God doesn't make a mistake. As the servant of the Lord, God placed him where he was in order to share the gospel with people who would have never heard any other way. Think about this. Paul's chains is what he's saying, is the means God would use to share the gospel with Praetorian guards. They wouldn't be going to a Bible study. They wouldn't be searching out a house church. And God now has them as chained to Paul actually hearing the gospel. Well, think about it. Paul's presenting his case before Roman judges, all right, judicial elite of Rome, what was he defending? His preaching? He's presenting the gospel. Think about this. To judges, to lawyers, right? To people who had never heard that message. Paul's chains would accomplish the advance of the gospel that could not have happened any other way. Don't you think Paul witnessing to those men, those other guards, were fellow soldiers? Let me tell you what this guy told me. All right? Don't you think judges would say, what do you think of this? You know, as they were talked among each other. Because of Paul's chains, Christ was known. So Paul submitted as a servant to his master, and he was rejoicing. I've seen what God was doing. It's like, I don't know if you had that experience that you're a place you said. I've had this was like missionary trips earlier in my life. I said I would never be a missionary in one place that I would never would go. And your kids used to say this when they were young. I'll never go to Africa, right? Don't ever tell God what you never do. Because he's always listening, all right? It's like telling your dad, I won't cut the grass. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah, all right. Don't <laughs> tell God what you won't do. But it was amazing, not on my list, ended up there. And how saw the hand of God, right? And Paul understood that instead of complaining of what God did not do, all right, he uh, ended up rejoicing in what God was doing, all right? He, it wasn't that keeping him out of prison that was the most important thing, but being where God wanted him to be. Paul would serve Christ until God called him home to heaven. And that gives joy. He saw God working. I'm a servant of God. It's not about me. It's about him. For me to live is what? It's Christ. I'm a, I got the joy of seeing what is being done. And we need to see our lives in that. You know, people look at the world in which we live, and I sometimes I'll, I'll tell folks, I'm glad I was raised as a young man in the 50s and 60s. Those of us that are older, all right, look back in this age, right? But you know what? God has put us all where he has chosen for a specific reason. If you're here raising children in this generation, God has put you here, all right, to be his servant, all right, and raising your children in the admonition and instruction of God. That's a high and holy calling. Instead of wishing that things were different, see yourself as a servant of God, placed by God in your situation, whether it's job, home, wherever it is, for a specific reason, and have joy as you see God using you in that situation. Let me give you the last one quickly. Paul would choose to remember not only as a son, I'm a servant, but Paul would remember 
and saw himself as a soldier, a soldier called to defend the gospel. He's chained to soldiers, but Paul sees himself as a soldier. Look at verse 27 and 28. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or I'm absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. Instead of seeing himself as a defeated man, state of weakness, I'm chained, all right, here, Paul chose to remember that he was a Christian soldier. I remember it used to be, I'm old enough, I remember that I had church services where we would sing Onward Christian Soldiers and be marching around the auditorium, all right? Uh, we might not do that today, all right? But we are still, as believers, all right, Christian soldiers. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. And Paul says, I am here to defend the gospel. Can I say this? You are not here in the world in which God has placed us at this time to blend in. All right? You're not here to blend in. You're here to stand out and defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul, he didn't back up on his message. He was there to defend the gospel. And through the gospel's message, Paul, along with all believers, we become a new creation in Christ. And as a new creation in Christ, we don't operate in our own power we operate in the power of the resurrected Christ. Galatians 2.20, no longer I that live, but what? Christ lived within me. 2 Corinthians 12.9, when Paul uh, really heard this message from God, he ends up, uh, the Lord told Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. Paul says, well, then, therefore, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may be manifest in me. And I'm saying as a soldier, we have to demonstrate the power of the gospel, the power of the resurrected Christ. Now follow me. How do you do that? Because see, you can look at Paul and say, he has no power. He's changed. We can look at ourselves. I'm, nobody knows me. I have no power. We live in the power, all right, of the gospel, the power of the resurrected Christ, all right, by how we conduct ourselves, by how we live in the midst of the circumstances God has put us. That's why he said in verse 27, let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. You know what I wrote down here? The greatest weapon you and I have against the enemy is a godly life, even in the midst of persecution, pain, and suffering. It's not your oratory, right? Not impressed by how much you know. But the greatest weapon you have is a godly life. Isn't that what Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.4? You must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. See, we need to behave what we believe. Hardest thing to do. See, it's easy to I'll come in on your face and challenge you with what I believe. But to live... And behave the gospel as Christ did in the midst of pain, persecution, and suffering. In the midst of the battle, even as Paul chose, all right, that even though he suffered, he chose to live faithfully for his Lord, seeing it as a privilege. If God suffered for me, how dare I say that I and though it should be free of all suffering and of all pain in my life. He got joy because he saw it as an honor that he could show the power of the gospel in his life. Instead of being retaliatory, cursing those men who abused him, he showed them what? Love. He showed them patience. He showed them kindness. Philippians 1.29, it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to what? Suffer for his sake. The world's not going to treat you right, but the world is not going to determine how I respond. 
Paul remembered, I'm a soldier of Christ. And that brought Paul great joy. Isn't there a verse in Romans that talks about for the joy that was set before him? Christ what? Endured the cross. That's what Paul was understanding. So what I'm saying this morning, we choose joy. And you can. Through remembering. All right? How God sees you. And God sees your circumstances right now. Remember, God sees you as a son. When you get, you know, you look in the mirror and you just, you don't like what you see, how life is going. Understand, you're a child of God. I mean, I mean where, where do you go from there? All right? Remember that you're a servant of the living God. God wants to work in your life in the midst of this world that his light can be seen. And remember that you're a soldier. You're set here for this time to strive for the gospel of Christ. People need to hear the gospel. The number one need in our nation, all right, is not money. It's not lower index of inflation. I would like to see that and all these things. The number one need is the gospel. People need to hear the gospel. And I'm saying this morning, no matter where we are, you know, we could choose joy. And we can have that peace. We don't have to give in. In fact, there's a verse when you go to chapter 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. And again, I say rejoice. Let's every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I think we're just going to do just a quick invitational, um, Jason. But again, maybe it's got, you have a situation, nobody knows it. Maybe you feel, just like Paul was chained to those guards, maybe you feel you're chained to something. It could be a financial, it could be emotional, it could be a family, it could be job. I don't know what it is. And you see no way out. Maybe there isn't a way out. Maybe that's exactly where God wants you at this time in your life. But you can choose to see yourself through the eyes of God. Maybe you just need to say, Lord, just well, maybe sing that verse, I surrender all, that ends up that you just say this morning, I surrender all. What if we could all stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If God has really touched your heart and you feel that you need to do this, whether you come here, whether you do it at your seat, but surrender to Him in what situation you are in.